I want to ask a question. How many of you have heard of global warming? Raise your hand. Okay. How many of you think it's true? Okay. So I don't have to do so much to convince you guys to make my job a little easier. Um, okay. So who's responsible for it? We are. We are, right? And we, so we know why it happens, and we know how it happens, right? We got that science basically down. Um, so basically, and we already know where we're heading. We're, we're putting, we're investing a lot of money into analyzing our current, our past, and our future. And honestly, it doesn't look very, but it looks pretty grim. Um, so how can we resolve this problem, right? There's, there's a couple of um, ideas out there, right? I'm sure many of you have heard about it. Renewable energy, solar, wind, geothermal, uh, and wave energy. All of these things that could be replenished by the natural forces on, on our planet. And also portable energy, such as hydrogen production in, um, for fuel cells in cars, or, or diesel, or ethanol. Uh, so those are kind of like uh, our current kind of proposed solutions to this. Um, however, when you really think about it, uh, in order to accomplish these things, we have to be sustainable. So that's kind of the concept that I've been uh, kind of um, uh, inspired by. So there's like these three major pillars of sustainability, which is there should be an environmental aspect, a social aspect, an economic aspect to every project that you build. So if all engineers kind of keep this in the back of their mind every time they're designing a project, then we can hope to finally achieve this kind of superior state. So I've been looking at kind of case studies on my own time, kind of when, and when I'm designing a project, I also incorporate these ideas. So I kind of look towards the future, seeing what these really um, talented people could project things in the future. So this should give you like a kind of a glimpse of what future engineers might hope to achieve if they keep these three pillars in the back of their mind. Um, of course, there's going to be a lot more green space because we have to tr we have to kind of um, understand that we're not different from nature. We are still an animal. We're just a very an animal with a little bit more intellectual ability and more dexterous. Uh, limbs. That's about the only difference between us and them. So we have to try to go back to nature. And also whenever we design a project, there's, there's this concept of cradle to cradle. So whenever we design a project, we have to take the entire life cycle into consideration, which is the construction material. When, during operation, how can we optimize it? Like changing air filters or things like that in, in a normal building, or in the demolition of it. How can we uh, like uh, get rid of the materials and um, kind of make sure that no environmental uh, factors are kind of devastating the environment. So these are some, um, this is like a, like a kind of an interesting case study. When I was trying to become fluent in environmental engineering design, uh, so this is an interesting case, uh, a lily pad. You guys know what, how that is, right? So. It's like a leaf that floats on the water, right? It's very wide and it, it won't sink. So engineers kind of used this, this concept to design buildings. Um, and, and this is kind of a bio-inspiration concept. So they came up with this design, which is basically, this is a very, this is a design that's very sustainable. And uh, so everything here is like living walls, there's a, there's wind energy, underwater, there's, there's all this uh, algae growth. So some of the, the main things that they used when in engineering for this kind of future concept is they incorporated renewable energy and there's also a movement towards biomass power. So in the future there's going to be this, this move towards uh, using bioreactors for energy because it's sustainable. It's something that could be produced on site and we're not depleting uh, natural resources that were cultivated millions of years ago. That's what we're running on right now. But that those sources are dwindling. It's all old algae that was produced millions of years ago. We're, 
defined over millions of years. So it'd be nice if we could produce algae or diesel on our own, at least for the moment, until the future technologies catch up. This is, an, this is another kind of a, a case study that I like, which was engineers kind of look towards, um, on a smaller scale, a bacteria that attaches to a surface and it has these spindles on the end. And what it did was, through evolution, it, this one kind of created their own uh, niche, which is these spindles, whenever water flows over them, these spindles move. And that vibration causes uh, a chemical reaction within it. So it, in, in an essence, creates electricity, at least through some part, through the fluid movement. So it's kind of uh, like wind power for us, even though it's fluid filled. So, uh, wind plus a house equals eco -cone. So, basically this concept was, um, imagine a bacteria that you put in contaminated waters. Because in the future, we're going to have to live in places that people normally would not live. So, if you, if you build these homes in contaminated waters, these homes, in essence, clean up the water. And they, they extract energy from wind flowing over what everyone knows that there's more wind over, over fluid, like uh, lakes. So these spindles collect that energy. And they also harness or they uptake water into the, the building itself and creates electricity. Like the methane fumes, and they also grow uh, bioreactors in it to produce electricity. So it's not a new, it's a, it's a new concept, but I feel like that that route will be further strengthened as time goes on. Um, so yeah, the reality check is, those are very nice technologies, but what are we gonna do in the meantime? I mean, we have a career life of about, we're gonna design for the next 50 years, but this technology won't be coming into place until, I don't know, after that time. When we're retired, probably that technology will be in use. So I'm kind of thinking practically. So, uh, we live in a petroleum-based economy right now. So that technology is here to stay. So what are we gonna do in the meantime? We have to use our uh, current infrastructure to kind of find solutions and decrease carbon emissions. So that's my background. So you guys kind of see the way that I see the, that problem orient you in my perception. Um, so yeah, a, sh a short story about myself. I just want to pass this around. Um, okay. So, basically in high school, there was this um, contest that our high school entered into, which was a, kind of like an engineering uh, contest where we had to design sustainable cars. So it's like, there was a team that designed the car, the fuel cell car. There was a chemistry that and I was basically in the mathematics team, but I was also in the biology. I, I was kind of mixing my interests, but my, my task was to basically how to provide hydrogen gas for the, for the car, right? And usually we do electrolysis. So the teachers thought I was just gonna do a simple, how much energy to uh, break apart the water to produce hydrogen gas. That's gonna be some simple linear plot but in, in biology, I noticed that you can force uh, algae to, to go into fermentation. And they developed that evolutionary niche to break apart water.